Um, let me say this. Uh, it is Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. And so hopefully, hopefully you're going to be celebrating somehow with your family, remembering um, being with friends, family, and usually it's like a barbecue day and a lot of people take off work and, and you know, it's an extended weekend. And, um, but but it's, it, it's one of those holidays where it's not, you know, even though like it is tomorrow, Memorial Day is tomorrow, but it's like it's become like a weekend affair for most people. Like we're, you know, and, and so like I was um, getting ready for my, for my message yesterday and, and I was preparing and thinking and scrolling on Facebook, you know, so I was getting, I was just, you know, kind of gearing up, right? Um, kind of getting some of those thoughts out of the way. Well, as I'm doing that, I'm seeing people and they're already, you know, great to start the weekend off early, you know, Memorial Day weekend and celebrating and they're on the lake and they're fishing and, you know, and I'm like, must be nice. Here I am. It's beautiful outside. Wish I could be fishing. Wish I could be out there with my kids. And literally in that moment, I caught myself and I was like, what? Where did that thought come from? I'm so blessed. It's not like I don't know what I have and what we have and what we share and what we are, it, what, the things that we get to do and the stuff. Like, it's not like I'm not aware. And yet in that moment, there's this little, this little thought that pops in our heads and it's like, oh, but, you know, must be nice. Must be. Have you ever said that? Like the must be nice thing? I think that's one of them. It is an indication of a sickness that lives deep within us. And it's this constant need to compare our lives to the lives of the other people around us. That is our tendency. Isn't this true? Oh, I'm just pretending, aren't I? Oh, yeah. My daughter's back there doing the button pusher for me today. It is our tendency to constantly compare ourselves, wouldn't you say this is true, to the people around us. No, I don't do that. I, I don't care what other people think. That's what I hear. And it's like, no, you're a liar, okay? We all do this, or we're tempted to do this. And we can say, no, I don't do this, but the truth is it's because we're trying to compensate for the fact that we kind of want to do this. Or it's like, no, I'm better than you, pastor. I don't do that. And it's like, well, what did you just do? You compared yourself to me. And it's like, we, we, we just have a tendency to do this. We look around and we, we pay attention to kind of where everybody else is in order to evaluate and measure where we are, kind of how we're doing. Well, I'm doing pretty good. And like, you know, they're this and they're that, but I'm, I'm like, I'm doing pretty good. Especially like if you're a student in here, like the middle, middle school and high school years, this is like so top of the list. It's so prevalent. If you're a, a, an adult and you remember back, like you know, like those were the years where comparison is such a dangerous trap that we fall into and we know it. And man, it's like, in, in, you're just inundated with it when you're that age. You know, it's like athletics and sports and grades and your friend group and just general popularity. And it's like, we're constantly kind of comparing ourselves to others. And for some of you, that may have actually been a pretty positive experience because you're like the above average. But for those of you who fall more into the average, below average realm within any of those categories, for you, it's a much different experience. For you, it can be extremely negative and extremely hurtful and, and very disappointing. A painful experience for you because you're just looking around and you just know what you do or don't have compared to them. They're they have more, they are better, they, they're prettier, they're smarter, they're going to be more educated, they're going to have a better life than me because they are this and I am not. And it's such a horrible trap, but then, but then it's like, oh, well, you'll get through it and then we'll grow up. And then, you, you know, this is true, adults, that you become an adult and you realize that this just follows you into adulthood. And now it's just in every ar arena and every facet of our lives. Next slide. It's like all of this stuff. And we are constantly, we don't mean to. I'm telling you, like, this is just prevalent. Like, it's, it's just built in to who we are. You know, it's like, why is that? Why are we so this way? Doesn't matter your stage of life or how old you are or who you are or what you do or don't currently have or will have or did have. Like, it doesn't matter. 
we all fall into this trap of like looking at all these different things and, and wanting to figure it out and wanting to compare ourselves and how am I doing? Well, compared to them. And it's like the thing is, is what we realize is we find ourselves, no matter where we fall, whether it's kind of a positive or a negative experience, we all find that at some point we're disillusioned. We're discontent. We're discouraged because it starts eating us up on the inside because we're constantly playing this game. Even though we know better, it's like, I know, like I shouldn't do that, but then we do it. And we open up our phones and we scroll and we see and, you know, news feeds. Oh, well, I'm not on social media. Well, you know, like, you know, I don't do the social media thing. I can't believe you do. Well, that's comparison, is it not? <laughs> like to say, oh, well, I don't do that. You do. I mean, it, it just is so sneaky. It's so destructive, so deceptive. And not just in our culture or in today's world. It's not just now. It is just a human problem and issue. And it really does. I mean, isn't this true? I think Solomon was right when he said that envy rots the bones. I said bones. <laughs> envy rots the bones. I mean, it, it's, it's something that seeps in, sneaks in. And, and we think because it, it's a temptation for all of us that it's just a human condition, therefore there's nothing we can do about it. And so, guess what? We just don't do anything about it. And it's like, ah, no big deal. And so, we, we don't do anything about it because it's a pervasive problem. It's like, well, and because we don't do anything about it, we don't manage it, and it begins to eat at us, and it causes all kinds of mental stress and physical problems and emotional problems and relational issues. I mean, it just does. It creeps into every facet of our lives because envy is the breeding ground. You ready? For discouragement, discontentment, disappointment, dissatisfaction, a lot of other dis words, disillusionment. And this right here, my friends, when this becomes characteristic of your life and my life, it is a recipe for disaster. It is. Nobody wants to live here. Nobody wants to experience this. Nobody wants this to be characteristic of their lives, and yet we don't really know what to do about it. Well, and, and, and just hang on. If you thought that was bad news, I've got more. I don't even know that this slide is in there, Grady. Um, what's the next slide? Oh, yeah. That's not it. So just back up one. This is a problem, let, let, I mean, this is just makes it so much better. This is icing on the cake, because we all know it's a problem. We all have this issue. We all, we all struggle with this. We just do. And, and the really good news is that the problem isn't going anywhere. It doesn't matter how old you are or what stage of life you're in. It just doesn't matter. The problem isn't going anywhere, and you ready? There's no solution. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Really, thanks for that encouragement today. That was awesome. There is no solution. There, there really isn't. There, there, it, it, it's not going away. It's always going to be there. There's always going to be the temptation anyway to, to compare ourselves to what's going on around us and kind of measure ourselves based on what we see in other people's lives and how other people are doing. And, and the, that'll constantly be there. And so what, what we do, since it's always there, and we think, well, it's just human condition. Here's what we do. We try to remedy it. And we go out and we just buy more stuff. And we fill up our houses and we buy a bigger house, you know, because we ran out of room in that house and we, we sell a perfectly good car in order to buy a better, a better car. And we, you know, take on mounds of debt that we can't really afford to have. And we, you know, pack our schedules so full that our kids can't stand what they're doing. And you know, we try to get them an education that, you know, kind of puts them a step up and it takes on more debt and loans and, and, and on and on it, go, on it goes. And yet, even still, we know that that doesn't satisfy because we are constantly still in that process of comparing because, because, because there's always somebody out there with a little bit more and who's a little bit better and a little bit more talented. It's just always the case, and it doesn't matter where you fall on that spectrum. Oh, but I'm like, I'm like super at the top. Like I'm, but there's, there's, you just know there's always, there's always a little bit more. There's always something more. There's always somebody more, a little bit smarter, a little bit better. And so even then, 
it never actually satisfies and we become extremely discontent, which, is, which contentment is the very thing that we all actually do want. And so here's the thing, though. Here's the beauty of being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, is because we know that. We know that it is a problem and will continue to be a problem because of sin. There will always be that temptation to look at our lives in terms of what we see in other people's lives. That will always be the temptation, and we know it as Christians. But we also know that there is something that we can do about it. In fact, there's something that we must do about it. We can't leave this alone. And so I want to help us, once again, try to put this back in front of us. Try to put it back in perspective. For those of us who are Christians, this should be a, a, a no-brainer kind of argument that you are convinced of, even if it's hard, a hard pill to swallow, even if it's difficult to like really maintain at the front of our minds every single day. But this should be something that we know, something that we believe and are willing to put into practice each and every day. So I want to go to, if, if you have your Bible, or if you we can follow along on the screen, however you want to do that, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, it's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians living in Corinth. And it was a Greco-Roman city. Um, he had started a church there, and apparently he was very fond of these people, spent a lot of time there and had really grown the church. I mean, things had really taken off. But then, as often was the case, he would leave and go to other places and plant churches. But then, other leaders and teachers would come in, a little bit jealous of Paul and his ministry and the, you know, the people that were kind of following along with him. And, and they would come in, and, and I mean, I even think in today's world, the way, even within the church, the way leaders handle other leaders and talk and try to kind of discredit and, you know... And that's what would, would happen. And he, he caught wind of this, that these other te- you know, false teachers, perhaps, that would come in and they would, they would essentially alter the things that, that he had been teaching them and they would try to discredit them in order to, in order to build themselves up. And so he would write to them, in, in this letter in particular, in, especially in chapter 10, he begins writing them and reminding them that the Christian life looks different, that we have a different standard. That the Christian life just looks different than the rest of the world, and it should. And so, and then, beginning in verse 12, he begins to lay out his approach based on the teachings of Jesus to how he handles this kind of criticism um, in, in the way that these other leaders were stepping in. And so listen to, listen to what he says. Verse 12, he says, we, and again, li- listen to who he's, how he's talking. This is like we as in he and the other leaders in his ministry, so to speak, okay? We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves, now, the way that some of this gets worded, um, maybe your translation, it looks a little bit different, but in the NIV, um, this is the way it's worded now. And, and so it can be a little confusing, especially as we get into the next verse. But he's basically saying, <clears throat> we, I choose not to boast by comparing myself to these other people, okay, to these other leaders and teachers. I'm just not doing that. Because they just commend themselves. And here's what he says. When they measure themselves, this is why he doesn't do it. When they measure themselves, these other people, by themselves, and compare themselves with themselves, they're not wise. It's like, oh, that's super helpful. He's saying, look, these are people who, you know, kind of in their circle, all right, you know, other teachers, other leaders, they're looking at one another in order to evaluate and measure their success. And so they are simply measuring themselves by looking at one another. They're comparing themselves with one another in order to see kind of who's top dog. I'm smarter. I have more influence. I have more clout. I've got more followers. More people listen to me. I'm, I'm more eloquent. I, I write better than you do. I've, I've 
written more literature than you do, more, I'm more well-read than you are. And in church world today, it's like we've got a bigger church than you do. Even on a Memorial Day weekend, we've got you know, a packed house, and it's amazing, and we've got all these... And, and they're constantly comparing themselves with themselves. And he said, that is foolishness. It's not wise, and it's not what we should be doing. And then he says, we, however, watch this, we will not boast beyond proper limits. Yeah, hang with me, G. Beyond proper limits. This is, this is really important. We will not boast beyond proper limits. Like proper limits, what does that mean? But we'll confine our boasting. Now notice this. He's saying that we do boast, but it's limited. In other words, we are going to compare but it's going to be very specific what we are comparing ourselves to. Boasting is okay as long as your motive is right, as long as you're boasting in the right thing. And so we're not going to boast beyond proper limits. There is an, an appropriate amount of boasting, but we'll confine our boasting to what? The sphere of service God himself has assigned to us and a sphere that also includes you. Now, think of it like, you know, a big circle, okay? So like, this is a sphere, because that's what spheres are, right? They're big circles, you know, okay. So if you just imagine that, he's saying it's okay to boast within these confines. Like, as long as I understand what these boundaries are, I can boast. And so that is your sphere of service, and it includes you. He's talking to these Corinthians. In other words, I've done my work among you, and, and it's been incredible, and God has done amazing things. And then I left, and so now I just want to see that your faith grows so that as your faith grows, my boasting can grow because I'm watching what God is doing in your life. And praise God for that. But that's within, and so here's what I want you to see. We're, we're gonna, it, it's a sphere of service, okay? The, this is the language he's using, a measure or a measurement. In other words, he's saying this is, this is the new measuring stick. This is what he's saying here. This is, go ahead with that next slide. This, this, there is, there is an appropriate measuring stick by which we can compare ourselves. Comparison isn't the problem. It's what we compare ourselves to. That's the problem. And he's saying that the appropriate measuring stick, if you will, this, this sphere of service is the, is the roles that God has uniquely assigned to, to you and me. And so in Paul's case, he's saying, you guys are within my sphere of influence, so to speak. You're within my sphere of service. You are within that. And then anything that happens in your life because of what God is doing in you and the influence that that, 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 that creates in the lives of other people, now that expands that circle, that sphere of service, if you will. So that is our new measuring stick. It's not to look around at other people and say, oh, well, look at what they're doing. I guess, I guess I'm, not, you know, I'm not as good of a speaker as they are, you know, and they, well, they seem to make more sense and they have more compelling and convincing arguments than I do and they've got a, a bigger church than I do and, you know, so they must be more successful and, and when you compare yourself that way, it's foolishness, not wise, it's destructive and you're only hurting yourself. There, there is no win. Nobody wins in comparison. Nobody wins the one comparing and the one who you're comparing yourself to. Nobody actually wins in that. But, but there is an appropriate way to measure, okay? Neither do we go beyond our limits, that sphere of service, by boasting of work done by others. We're not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to take credit for what other people are doing. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, here's the hope. Our hope so I've got my measuring stick, my sphere of service. My hope is that that grows. Like, that really is my hope. That, that's actually why I, I, I like when 
new people show up at a church service because like there's a sense of like okay so maybe there is some growth happening but I'm not going to make it about me because it's not about me it's really about what God is doing maybe in and through me us as a church family and so we're not going to go beyond our limits and act like well this is all about me I'm doing this our hope is that as your faith continues to grow our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand in other words um, as your faith grows, and he's, he's talking to these Corinthians, as, as I see your faith grow, then I, that will begin to spill over into the communities and the cities and the towns that are around you. And then now I, that becomes part of my sphere of service, my sphere of activity. Now that's a part of our influence. And man, I can boast in that because that's what God did in you and through you because of my service, because I recognized my role. I want it to greatly expand so that we can preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. Not just where you are, but beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory. That's not what really matters. And so, Paul understands this. And again, he's talking within the context of his ministry, and that can seem very vague and very, you know, 2,000 years ago. So what does it mean for you and me? Like, if, if there is an appropriate, an appropriate comparison that we can make, an appropriate measuring stick, a sphere of service, if you will, I believe it is the roles that God has uniquely assigned to you and me. Here's, what I would say, here's how I would say it. What really matters about your life are the unique roles that only you play in the lives of the people around you. What really matters, and here's the thing, I think we know this. Don't we? Especially the older we get, it's like we start learning. It's like, well, it's really not about money. It's not about my job or being super successful. It really is about people that I'm connected to. That's what really matters. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Like, that, that's what we end up that's the conclusion we come to. It's why this isn't just a, a Christian thing. This is just a, a, an all of us thing because, because we all recognize it at some point. You don't have to be a Christian to know, hey, relationships matter more. Hey, it's about me being a better husband, a better, a, a better wife, a, a better mom, a better dad, but not in comparison to the other moms and dads around me. My only measuring stick is is the role that God, the roles and the purposes that God has specifically assigned to me. That is my sphere. Right here. That's my only unit of measure. It's not to look outside that and say, well, let me compare myself to theirs. I mean, I've only got, you know, one kid, and man, I'm struggling with that one, and they've got 17 kids, and look how, like, they're all, like, uh, amazing, and athletes, and superstars, and you know, somehow they're paying for school and, you know, it's like amazing and they're the best. It's like, whoa, wait, wait, God didn't give you that role. That's not been assigned to you. That's theirs. So to compare yourself and your role to theirs is foolishness. There is no wisdom in that. Why? Because it hurts them and it hurts you. It's destructive. It does nobody any good. Nobody wins when you compare it like that. But when you are using the appropriate measure to compare yourself to, the, one that, the, the ones that God has placed in front of you, then you can experience contentment and success. Then you will find that boasting is, is an okay activity. It's okay to do because envy isn't chewing you up on the inside. You're just weighing yourself according to, to the roles that God has given to you as a wife, as a mother, as a dad, as a husband, as a sibling, as a child of parents, as an employee, as an employer, as a friend to a certain friend or a certain set of friends. That Those become unique roles for you. And then Paul says, let no one, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. 
Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. When you, when you maintain that sphere of service as your measuring stick, then you can boast because you're boasting in the Lord because God has assigned those roles to you. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. In other words, watch this. When people die, their praise usually dies with them. But for those who boast in the Lord, it's eternal. I mean, that's a guarantee. That's the, that's the beauty of being a Christian, is having that perspective. It's like, oh, you're just, you know, you're just kidding yourself. It's like, that's up for discussion. But because we believe that this is our authority, that Jesus is our Savior, then we believe that there is more to this life than just this life. And so how we manage the influence and the roles that we play in the lives of other people in terms of their faith and their maturity in Jesus, their relationship with Jesus, then we are able to boast. We can boast in that. We can boast in that because that is what God is doing in them and through them. And what if, what if you began to do that? I mean, as a Christian, I get it. Like, this is a massive shift in perspective. Like, it just is. Because this isn't how we operate. Like, this is definitely not what comes natural. We look around at the people sitting beside us. I mean, when you're young, it's the people, you know, in other desks around you or on the other side of the football field or, you know, sitting up in the stands or cheering. And, and then you get a little bit older and, you know, maybe it's the people who are, you know, graduating with lots of stuff and tassels around their neck, you know. I didn't have a lot of those colorful things around my neck when I graduated. And then it's, then it's our stuff and it's our possessions and it's the success of our kids and our kids' education. And, the, and we're just kind of, I mean, we, we get that. We know like that is the, the tendency and we're good at it. And, and we try to justify it by saying, well, I mean, that's just the way it is. And, you know, after all, it, it, it gives me some drive. You know, when I see what other people are doing, it just makes me want to be better. And I'm like, baloney. It's defeating. The only drive, because here's what happens. When, when you are driven by comparing yourself to other people, when that's what's driving you, it will lead you in one of two directions. You want to know what those are? It will either lead you to a false sense of pride and arrogance, or it will lead you to a sense of absolute discouragement, disillusionment, discontentment, and just a general unhappiness with life because there's always somebody a little bit better. Well, you didn't measure up. That cannot be. That cannot be. For the Christian, that cannot be our measure of success. That is not our standard. And I would just propose that even if you're not a Christian, this is worth considering, isn't it? Because just imagine... Just imagine if you actually were able to put this into practice. This is for all of you. Like, what, what if, what would life look like and feel like to you if you actually put this into practice? Like, you legitimately, you got up every day and you said, I'm not compare. I'm just not. I'm doing what it takes. I'm not going to compare myself. And no, I'm not saying, well, you got to dump social media and you've got to move into an igloo in Alaska and completely be alone. Because the truth is, nobody's doing that. You're going to be around people. And whether you're on social media or not, you see what other people are doing, what they have, who they are. And you are tempted to compare yourself. But what if you stopped and you chose to compare yourself, to measure yourself based on the God-given unique roles that he has placed in front of you. The things that really only you can do during this season. What, what if you became the kind of mother you needed to be 
to your children, the kind of father you needed to be to your children, the kind of spouse you needed to be to your husband or your wife, the kind of sibling that your sibling needed to be, the kind of brother or sister, the kind of friend, the unique kind of friend. What if you began to do that? What would life look like? And l- let me just say it this way. Let me say it this way, and, and I don't know if I can convince you of this or not in the time we have left, but let me just say it this way. Nobody else can do what is completely unique to you. Nobody else can do. Oh, you, you, I mean, come on. Like, I mean, if something were to happen to me, there could be another mom to my kids. I mean, there's adopted kids, and there's, you know, like, I'm talking about today. As things are right now, And that applies even, you know, of course, to being a mom or a dad or being a husband or wife or being a sibling, but but even in extension to to your friend groups, to being a friend, to being the, the, the kind of friend that that person needs right now, to be the kind of employee that you need to be right now. Yes, anybody can fill a position and learn the job, but I'm talking about they can't do it right now because you're in it right now. So it is a God-given assignment for you right now. And if you begin to view it that way, that changes things. It's a change in perspective or being that kind of boss. I mean, it doesn't matter. If you understand that those relationships are my measure of influence, my measure of success, my sphere, my circle of service, if you will, that God has given me these roles, they're unique to me right now in this season and so am i what am i doing with these roles how am i measuring up because nobody else can do what only you can do right now it's unique to you three quick thoughts on how to begin doing this and it just starts right here it starts with a stop stop the comparisons choose and this, is, this will be a daily battle, okay? So I get that. I'm telling you, like as I was sitting there yesterday, it was like, what am I? I'm literally writing a message about this and I'm thinking about it. Like, where did that thought come from? That, that's, just what, that's just what happens. But choosing that moment, because I, I like stopped myself in that moment. I was like, hold up, that's, that's ridiculous. Stop the comparisons. Stop. It's not good for you and you know it and it's not good for, for other people. It doesn't help anybody. Nobody wins. It's going to hurt somebody. It will lead to disillusionment and destruction. And it's artificial. It's artificial. It's not reality. To only pay attention to somebody's highlight reel on Instagram or Facebook, you know that that's a false reality. So stop. You've said it before. And yet we still look and we still get a little little bit of that envy rising up in us. And don't... in that moment, do what it takes. Stop that comparison, but replace it. And then don't, don't settle for average. See, this is one of the problems with comparison is that it causes you to settle. Oh, what do you mean? Like, I don't understand. Because when you look around, you'll always find some people that you feel like you're kind of doing a little bit better. Well, they're, you know, they, they really, they're pretty and they're smart. And they're athletic, and they're popular, but I'm a little bit prettier. I'm a little bit smarter. I'm a little bit more athleticer. (laughs) I'm more educateder. There's all kinds of errs out there, and and we don't mean to, but it's like as long as we can go home and feel like we've got a few more errs than, than somebody else, then we're okay. As long as I check out. And guess what? That's just to settle. That's not a help. That doesn't do you any good either. Don't settle for average. Set the right boundary. Set the right measure of success. That's that sphere of service. Set it. Pay attention to it. Know what those unique roles are that God has assigned to you. And use that as your measure. And then don't settle for average. Don't settle. And then... This is the only way you're going to figure it out. Take your cue from the one who made you. Take your cue. You know what your cue is? In other words, it's God saying, these are my boundaries for you. 
These are the roles that I've assigned to you. These are the things that I have placed in your care. And so all I'm concerned about is how you manage those because I want you to be more concerned with how those relationships and how your kids and your family and your friendships are growing and maturing in a relationship with Jesus in order to create more influence in the world around you. That's what I care about. Compare yourself to that. How are you doing? Let, let, me, let me throw, this is a question you've got to start asking yourself. This is the last, last slide. What am I doing with the God-given roles that are unique to me? Write that down. Take a picture, whatever you got to do. What am I doing with the God-given roles that are unique to me? Because guess what? There is nobody. You, there, will, there will never be a better mom to your kids than you if you start. There will never be a better dad to your kids than you if you start. There will never be a better husband or wife to your husband or wife, except for you, if you start. There will never be a better employee in the job that you have right now, if you start. There will never be a better boss than you, if you start. There will never be a better specific friend for this season of life in that person's life than you if you start. But you have to start. (laughs) You have to start. And the way you start is by taking your cue from God and paying attention to those God-given, unique roles that He has assigned to you and stop playing the comparison game. And this is a message for you, and it's a message for me. We've got to get this right. And as Christians, there is no choice. We know better. We know better, but we need to be utterly convinced of it. So much so that that we're willing to put this into practice. Just imagine what life would look like. How would it feel? Don't you think it would feel better? Don't you think? I mean, come on, like, rather than look around at what, I mean, that is a miserable way to live life because there's never enough. It's why nobody's ever satisfied, and you know it. It's like, I know, but I wouldn't mind having blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, that's fine. Pursue those things, but they may not come, and there's some things that aren't attainable. Like, they're just the things that you're gifted. Like, I'm not going to be a professional football player. I, I don't care if I'm, but I'm just committed. I'm determined. I'm comparing myself to, you know, to those guys. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. That's going to push me. Like, what good does that do? That will do nothing for me, and it doesn't do anything for anybody else. That hurts me, and it hurts the people around me. But how rich would life begin to look and, and peaceful and content? if envy was left at the door and we began to just see these God-given unique roles that God has placed in our lap as the most important things in our lives, what a difference that would make. Would you bow your heads? I cannot... I cannot stress enough um, how much I believe that's true, even though I fall to that temptation all the time. But that's just because the problem isn't going anywhere and there's no fix because we're broken, sinful human beings. But the truth is, there is something we can do about that, and we have to. But it is a, it, all it is is a change in perspective to just see things differently, to choose it. What are the things that you pay attention to? What are the things that you talk about? What are the things that you dwell on? 
What are the things that you long for? What are the things that drive you? That will say a lot about what your standard of success is. But if it's anything beyond the unique God-given roles that God has assigned to you, then it is not wise. It's foolishness. It's only what God is doing in you and through you in the lives of the people he has placed you into a relationship with. That's what he wants to see happen. What if it wasn't about you being, just being a, a really good wife or a better husband, but what if you became a really good wife and a better husband for your family? What if that's what motivated you? What a difference that would make. And I just want to encourage you. It's always about relationship. It's always, about, and we know it. Man, it's just easy to get distracted from it. But my prayer for you is that you would sense it, that you would see it. And God has made, God has made it possible through Jesus. I just want to invite you, just right where you are. I, I know this, this is going to hit everybody at different places, but I, this doesn't become a reality for us until a relationship with Jesus becomes a reality for us. And so I just want to encourage you to, to step into that relationship if you haven't before. Like if that's something you know, like I know I need that, I need Jesus I want to walk in faith and by faith, and I want to put my trust in him. I, I, I want to encourage you to do that, like right now, right where you are. We're not going to do weird stuff. We're not going to call you out. We're not going to, you know, tell you to come behind a curtain or anything. We just, I, I just, right where you are, between you and your heavenly father, I just want to invite you to invite Jesus in to your mess. Pray something like this, heavenly father. I know I'm a mess. I know I'm a sinner. Tired of doing this on my own. I know I need Jesus. I believe he is my savior. I've been running from it for a while. But I want to invite you into my mess today. Because I know that's the relationship that I've got to get right first. Would you fill me with your spirit? Would you change me from the inside out? And would you give me the boldness to invite others into that same relationship with you? God, I give you my life to the best of my ability right now. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.